right. Welcome. My name is Deborah Harris. Feature engineering is a key component of machine learning. The purpose of this talk is to demystify feature engineering and make it accessible to anyone interested in machine learning. This is my first talk at Pi Ohio, and I'm excited to talk with you today. Is my clicker not going to work now? There we go. I'm currently getting my master's in data science at Elmhurst College, which is up in Chicago. I graduate in December 2019, and I enjoy solving business problems with magic, I mean algorithms. I'd like to address gender parity in the field of data science, and I spend time learning new things every day. I'd like you to meet my sorcerers, actually my mentors. I've only personally worked with one of my, mem my mentor mentors, which is Dr. Coolidge at Elmhurst College. But I do consider the others mentors, since I've been able to study their books and follow them online. Their feature engineering principles will be used throughout this presentation. This is the beauty of the information age. We can mentor with anyone that has published their work. Andrew Ng, one of the most prolific researchers in machine learning and AI states. Coming up with features is difficult. It's time consuming. It requires expert knowledge. Applied machine learning is basically feature engineering. So what is a feature? A feature is a numeric representation of raw data. Our machine learning models cannot ingest data that isn't numeric. We will learn how to handle these issues. The right features are appropriate to the problem we are trying to solve and should be easy for our machine learning model to process. Thus, feature engineering is composing the most appropriate features given our data, model, and problem to solve. It's often said that data is the fuel of machine learning, but this isn't quite true. Data is like the crude oil of machine learning, which means it needs to be refined into features to be useful for training a model. Without relevant features, you can't train an accurate model, no matter how complex the machine learning model. Feature engineering, art or science. Mr. Domingo says, often the raw data is not in a form that is amenable to learning, but you can construct features from it that are. This is typically where most of the effort in a machine learning project goes. It is often also one of the most interesting parts where intuition, creativity, and black art are as important as the technical stuff. In my opinion, feature engineering is both an art and a science. The intuition and creativity come into play through one's domain knowledge. Domain expertise is essential for focusing on the features relevant to the problem at hand and in creating new or enriching existing features to amplify the information contained in the data over the noise. Business insight is a powerful aid in engineering the right representation of the data. Why do we need feature engineering? First, we want to apply domain knowledge to our problem. Secondly, we want to maximize the information density of our data. And finally, we want to improve the accuracy of a model and its interpretability. I want you to remember this statement. In machine learning, your model is only ever as good as the data you train it on. Machine learning isn't perfect. It's not something magical. It's something we need to, we need to do all the data pre-processing and cleansing and feature engineering because machine learning models, they can't tolerate dirty data with missing values or categorical values. They're also sensitive to the noisy data, which means they get confused if we include data that doesn't make sense. 
we will primarily focus on the manual feature engineering with a brief listing of the automated feature engineering tools that are available in Python at the end. How do we learn this dark art? Practice, practice, practice. Where does feature engineering fit inside the world of data science? We have the three spheres. We have the business expertise and domain knowledge. This is the first step in feature engineering as we apply our expertise to the problem at hand. Secondly, we have our mathematics and our statistics. We use these tools to analyze our features and see which ones to keep and which to drop. Finally, our friend, computer science. It's the instrument by which we implement the analysis of our features. Machine learning, what is it anyway? It's essentially giving computers the ability to learn from data without explicit rules being given by a programmer. This is the difference between classical algorithms and machine learning. In classical algorithms, a human has to come up with the best solution first. In machine learning, the model is not told the best solution first. It is provided with examples of the problem and told to figure out the best solution. Machine learning is a game of correlations and relationships. Once the model has pinpointed the relationships, it can predict future relation observations or generalize the data to reveal interesting patterns. There are three basic types of machine learning models. Supervised learning finds associations between the features of a data set and a target variable. Regression attempts to predict a continuous response, such as temperature, budget, or time. Classification attempts to predict a categorical response, true, false, or churn, or not churn. And that's the one we'll be doing today, supervised learning and classification. Unsupervised learning models have a more open objective than prediction. They can reduce the dimension of data or find groups of observations that behave similarly and cluster them together. They are not used for prediction. Reinforcement learning models get to choose an action in an environment and then are rewarded positively or negatively for choosing this action. These are commonly used in robotics and self-driving cars. Here's our data set. This is a bank loan data set from IBM's Cognitive Class AI. Our problem to solve is which bank customers are more likely to have paid off their loans? And that is our target variable, the loan status. The pandas head function is returning the first 10 rows of our loan data set, which is a pandas data frame. Each row of data, also known as an observation, represents a single instance or example of a problem. Each column is an attribute that may be used in the feature engineering process. I will be referring to all columns as features until they are proven unhelpful or hurtful. We will be eliminating or transforming them as we progress through this presentation. We also have examples of quantitative and qualitative data. Quantitative data is numerical. It's measuring something. The principal terms, date, and age columns are quantitative data. Qualitative data is categorical data. It describes the quality of something. The loan status, education, and gender are qualitative data. At the bottom, we have the shape function, which is returning a tuple, which represents the dimensionality of our data frame. And quite simply, it's just returning the number of rows and columns. Here we are. We're getting started on our actual model, which is random forest. This is a decision tree here. Random forest is a supervised learning model. We feed it labeled data. The random forest model is a forest of decision trees like this one. 
Random forest is considered a highly accurate and robust method because of the number of decision trees participating in the process. It does not suffer from the overfitting problem that many machine learning models have because its output is the result of many individual decision trees. It will also rank the features in terms of importance. Here's the meaning of random in random forests. The training data for each tree is created by a random sampling from the full data set with replacement. This is called a bootstrap sample. And then also only a subset of variables is considered when deciding how to split each node, which is also chosen randomly. Finally, the prediction with the most votes from the individual decision trees wins. From SK Learn Ensemble, we're importing the random forest classifier. The CLF variable is our instantiation of the model. N estimators stands for the number of the individual trees in the forest, which is 15. The criterion is the function to measure the quality of the split. We chose entropy, which is a measure of information gain. Finally, at the bottom, we have the label. We are identifying which, we're gonna identify which label the uh, classifier is going to look at to make its decisions. So, which training features did we select? Why not all of them? We'll find out soon enough. We will train our model on the training data set using the fit function, and that is essentially scikit's learn, learns name for training. So what do you think happened when we ran this? So far, so good, right? What could possibly go wrong? It all looks great, it's all magic, right? What? Value error? How did that happen? value error, could not convert string to float. Random forests cannot use data that hasn't been converted into a numeric value. This is a small example of why we must use feature engineering with machine learning models. <sighs> That's me, frantically looking up stuff on Google, looking through my feature engineering books going, what did I do? wrong this time. You got to get comfortable with errors on any program. I mean, you guys all know that, but for me as a perfectionist, they drive me nuts. Okay, we need to convert that gender into a binary, right? So just please note, I'm only transforming one column or attribute to get a baseline for an accuracy score. If I go through and I change all the categorical variables, we've done all our feature engineering. So just for illustration purposes, that's why I did that. All right, this time our random forest model did train. We got something. So now we need to evaluate this model. So we'll use the test data set and we'll establish a baseline accuracy as a measure of improvement to document the efficacy of our model without any serious feature engineering or adjusting any of the hyperparameters of the model. So we'll make the same changes to our test data set as we do to the train data set. So you can see we replaced the male and female strings for binary values and then we dropped those unused columns. And I don't know if you guys got a chance to see this at the beginning, but I actually have a Jupyter notebook that you can look at this in, in your free time when you have nothing else to do when you're, you're bored. And then I also have a bit.ly link for the slides that you can look at later too. And I'll post that at the end. So we used the predict function on our testing data set and we got a baseline accuracy of 68, 60, 69%. That's pretty good without any serious feature engineering. My professors will always told me, hey, if you get above 60%, that's pretty, that's, that's not too bad. But uh, remember, random forests is a very efficacious machine learning model, and it's one of my favorites. 
So let's see how we can improve these results by conducting the incantations that I've learned from the best feature engineering sorcerers. We will be using a truncated version of the data science life cycle. We will briefly touch on each of these items. We will do some data cleaning, fixing the inconsistencies within our data and handle any missing values. We'll do some data exploration. We'll form some hypothesis or observations about our problem by visually analyzing the data. Of course, the feature engineering. We'll select the important features and construct more meaningful ones from the raw data that we have. Predictive modeling. We're going to train our machine learning models and evaluate them. And the data visualization, which is communicating our results visually to our stakeholders. So let's do some initial data exploration. Our target variable is the data set is the loan status. So how many customers paid off their loans? About 260, while 86 went into collection. And let's look at the education. Let's do a value counts on that. We can see that the majority of the customers have some college or below, which is interesting. We'll see if that has any effect. Let's explore some of the basic statistics of our quantitative features, our numerical features. The describe method will only pull up your quantitative features, not your qualitative. So we see the count of the variable, the mean, the standard deviation, minimum, the interquartile range, which is 25, 50, 75 percent, and then also the maximum. There's a few things that kind of jump out to me here a little bit. First of all, what's that unnamed stuff? Those two columns there. I don't think they're bringing too much value to this data set, so we'll deal with those shortly. And let's look at principal. Now, if we look at that, the mean value on it, it's actually pretty close to 1,000. So that would indicate that possibly most of the loans were in the $1,000 range. And then also, the mean value for age is almost 31. Oops. Here we go. Let's do some data visualization with the Seaborn library. We imported Seaborn, and we generated a couple of charts. We divided them by male and female, and we're looking at the principal. Now notice that what we saw before, we can see that most of the loans are in the $800 to $1,000 range. In addition, there are more loans for men versus women. So this is the beauty of data visualization during your data exploration. Your brain can process this information with greater insight than it can by merely looking at a spreadsheet. Now let's look at this visualization here by age. It's interesting, isn't it? Look, notice the increase in the collection category, the blue, in the male bar chart. Men in their, this would seem to indicate, no judgment, men in their 20s and 30s have high incidences of loans not being paid off. Hmm. The female bar chart does not indicate a similar dramatic rise. So, we could make a hypothesis or an observation that women are a better credit risk than men. I don't know. It's part of the process. Are you ready to hear the incantations? Ada ustas rudis pars abracadabra. Oh, adjusting raw features. Simul rudis pars and aliquid novi. Alakazam. Combining raw features into something new. Tabus rudis pars utublialis. Ooh, getting creeped out here. Bippity boppity boo. Decomposing raw features into usable subsets. See, we're getting this all figured out, right? We're demystifying it. It's not that hard, is it? All right, so let's get, some, let's get going on some adjusting the raw features. This is where we would do all of our data cleaning, checking for missing values, all the housekeeping and the house cleaning, renaming columns, dropping columns, et cetera. It's the sexy stuff of data science, okay? It's real sexy, I'm telling you. So we're going to use that isNull function to discover if there are any missing variables. Are there any missing values? 
No, we're not missing any values. But if there were, we would need to make a decision as to how to approach this issue. So we could drop those rows, possibly, or we could fill them in with an educated guess. For example, if we were missing age values, we could fill them in with that mean value that we had, which was approximately 31. Just an example. Remember those first two rows? They're a function of some sort of funky index or whatever. So using the drop function, they're out of here. We're getting rid of those guys. They bring absolutely no value to what we're trying to do here. Now we're going to convert our due date feature to a pandas date time object so we can further manipulate this feature in the next incantation. And continuing to adjust our raw features, let's take a little look at that gender grouped with the loan status. Let's notice that it does say that 87% of the females repaid their loans versus 73% of the men. Again, no judgment, no judgment. All right, and here we go. Now our machine, remember, our machine learning model needs to digest the gender category as a numerical value. So we will convert the male to zero and the female to one. Now we're ready to explore our second incantation, combining raw features into something new, transmutation, frog legs, whatever else we need. So now we're gonna do some encoding of our categorical variables. So let's explore this incantation with the education field. Notice that the paid off versus the collection percentage is nearly identical in all the education groups, about 75 to 25%, except for master or above, which is a 50-50 split. So we're going to do some one-hot encoding. That's how we're going to make this raw feature into something new. This transforms an attribute into multiple columns that represent the original category numerically. For example, in education high school, there at the very top, you see it'll be converted into a one when present or zero when not. Alert. Even though this says dummies by default, <laughs> Pandas get dummies does not do dummy encoding, but one-hot encoding. So there's a distinct difference between dummy encoding and one-hot encoding. Just keep that in mind when you're doing your machine learning techniques because sometimes you may be required to use the dummy encoding so as to avoid dependency among the variables. That's beyond the scope of this talk. Now let's drop that master or above column since there are only two values in the entire data set. As machine learning apprentices, we need to learn how to discern which features will bring the most potent information gain for our model to ingest. Because remember, we're trying to get the, as much density in our data set as possible. Using the pandas concat function, let's add those one hot encoded columns to our training data frame. This is just illustrating a simple example of the concat function to put the two data frames together. Oops. Yen Sid has come to make an appearance. Did you see my mistake? Did you catch it? Anyone? Bueller. <laughs> Bueller. No one caught it? Anybody catch it? Anyone? Anyone? All right. Excellent. A plus. I forgot to drop the education. I'm showing you warts and all. I'm, I'm, not per I'm not perfect. I'm an apprentice, OK? I'm an apprentice. So using the pandas drop function, I need to drop that column. That would have wrecked a little, caused a little problem, right? It would have made it go kablooey. We don't want that. All right, ready for our final incantation. So let's visualize the effect day of the week plays in this data set and split by gender. Notice zero through three represent Monday through Thursday and four to six is Friday, Saturday, Sunday. What do you notice? What's happening to collection on the weekend? It's rising on both male and female. This would indicate that loans taken on the weekend for either gender are less likely to be paid off. That's an interesting pattern, isn't it? 
So we're going to subset the effective date feature into a day of the week and a weekend feature, just using a simple lambda function. Now remember, the weekend feature encompasses Friday through Sunday. Ready for our final touches. We're selecting our final features, and note, we're only choosing the weekend for our date feature because that gave us some information gain, didn't it? We also did normalization of our continuous features. Standardization of a data set is a common requirement for many machine learning models. They may behave badly if the machine features are do, if those individual features do not more or less look like your standardly normalized distributed data, which is a bell curve, our famous bell curve. We all learned that in school, right? So we are going to be standardizing principal terms and age using SK Learn's built-in Z-score normalizer. I'm not sharing this normalization code with you here. It's in the Jupyter Notebook, and you're free to look at it. Just remember, several of the machine learning algorithms are particularly sensitive to the scale of the data, like k-nearest neighbors, k-means, and what they have in common is they're measuring distance. Distance is very heavily used in those algorithms, so you definitely want to do some uh, standardization. Moment of truth. Here we are. So now we ran the fit function on our random forest classifier using our freshly engineered features that we worked so hard on, right? We've got to do the same thing to our test data set, replicating it all. And was it worth it? We improved our accuracy, right? It's pretty good. But remember, random forest is a very efficient classifier. The results may have been much more dramatic with a different machine learning model and data set. But this is about an 18% improvement, percentage to percentage. But this is a small taste of the massive task that's undertaken by data scientists and machine learning engineers. Feature engineering is imperative to having a successful and production-ready machine learning pipeline. Do you recall that I mentioned that random forest model identifies feature importance? Yellowbrick provides machine learning visualization that extends the scikit-learn API with visual analysis and diagnostic, diagnostic tools. I love this visualization command. Poof. I mean, it's magical, right? And here you go. Poof. What an informative visualization. This is useful for determining any hyperparameter tuning that you may wish to, call, to conduct, and also it's great for presentation to your stakeholders. When all is said and done, age is a huge predictor. And remember that that was included in our original thing. So feature engineering did make a substantial difference in it, and it really helped increase our accuracy score. I did promise you some Python automated feature engineering tools. I have used the first two in grad school, the TS Fresh and the Feature Tools. AutoFeet I've just read uh, about, but those, those are all Python tools that will be ready for you. So may I have a drum roll, please? <laughs> Thank you. Congratulations. You've mastered the basics of feature engineering. <laughs> Thank you for spending your time with me today. If you have any questions, see me in the hallway later. Absolutely. The GitHub, are you looking for the GitHub stuff? Oh, the TS Fresh? There you go. Sure, no worries. Hi. Yeah, Deborah.